Hi, I'm Derek Mills. Welcome back to Professor Christopher Chappell's lectures about the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. Let's continue with the next lecture. In the intervening spaces of that freedom, there are also other intentions due to residues of karma. The cessation of the residues of karma is said to be like the diminishment of the afflictions. Tat chidreshu pratyaya antarani samskare bhyaha. Tat chidreshu pratyaya antarani samskare bhyaha. Tat chidreshu pratyaya antarani samskare bhyaha. Hanam esham kleshavaruktam. Hanam esham kleshavaruktam. Hanam esham kleshavaruktam. Ah, human life. We know, we can sort of taste what it is to be free. And hopefully you've encouraged yourselves on the path of yoga and encouraged your students also on the path of yoga to be able to get close to at least that feel, that taste of freedom, to remember that taste of freedom, to build circumstances that will allow that blessed experience to return, acknowledging, of course, that all of this is through analog, all of this is through a rather elliptical process, remembering always never to concretize or claim that experience. And the reality is that the overwhelming majority of life in the world is not in that state of freedom. Even for the specialists, when I've been with really sublime, vaunted sages in India who have reached publicly recognized high levels of conscious awareness. What I see are individuals working tirelessly down in the weeds, giving darshan, receiving the woes of the world through the narratives of their students, in some cases hugging them, in other cases listening with an, intent, with an intentive an attentive ear, encouraging very specific building projects or pilgrimages on the behalf of nature. These people do not remain in the cave, but these people are actively attempting to repair the world. Would it not be blessed if all people of good intent were in a position to give encouragement to others, but giving encouragement is a lot of work. Blessed work, but nonetheless, not in a place of freedom. For the everyday person for whom freedom might be a fleeting, evanescent, like once in a while thing, generally in those in-between spaces, there will be the burden of the life that has already given shape and form to this life. And that life, whether it be with oak trees or maple trees, the rising sun, the setting sun, that life is driven by the residues of past karma. And that past karma cannot be managed necessarily 
with great accuracy. Sometimes there may be a surprise from a past impulse that will sort of come up. And sometimes through monitoring dream, through monitoring mood, there can be an anticipation that, oh yeah, this old karma, it's going to have a little bit of a stinger on it when this next Tootsie Roll presents itself or whatever it may be, okay? And in the story, the story of spiritual pilgrimage, in the story of inquiry, in this narrative that one builds in order to understand narrative, Patanjali reminds us that to deal with these recurring karmic impulses, think back to the second pada. And in the second book of the Yoga Sutra, Patanjali itemizes the kleshas, ignorance, egotism, attraction leading to addictive behavior, repulsion leading to hatred perhaps, that oomph, keep going, keep going. All of those present in very specific ways, grounded out of, rising from the base of past action. And what does he say to deal with the klishta karmas? He says, dhyana. He says, meditate. And similarly, in the fourth pada, he says, do what you did for those kleshas. It is said that will work. They can be overcome, they can be hunted down, they can be stopped in their tracks. I love this word, hanam. It's the ground word, the ancient word for hunt. It also means to strike hard and allow it to go into vini vritti, allow it to go into that place of being discontinued, out of stock, no longer having it. Okay? That's the challenge of effective meditation. So again, meditation. Allow moments where even the physicality of that Tootsie Roll, you can visualize it, you can put it in front of you, could even perhaps taste it, at least in the mind's eye. Physical object, Vitarka. And then work with your comportment, work with your carriage, work with your chariot, work with the vehicle of narrative associated with that Tootsie Roll, whatever that Tootsie Roll may be. And by meditating, by interrogating, by asking, where, Tootsie Roll, where from do you arise? And in my own instance, oh, I remember the long Tootsie Rolls, I remember the fat Tootsie Rolls, I remember the candy store. Ari's from Lindenville, New York, I remember so distinctly. And then if I trace it through all the way up to having the tooth ripped out and the implant installed, can see origins and consequences. It's a sobering tale, a tale that I've lived long enough to tell, a tale that was interrupted pretty much right in the middle with a horrible toothache. And we were laid into the ashram. It was around 10.30 at night. I had driven quite a distance and my toothache was so profound, a tooth that has since been replaced with an implant. And I looked miserable, I felt miserable. And my beloved Guru Ma looked over, said, what's the matter with you? 
and said, my tooth hurts. And she smiled. And oh, I went into a little bit of a burn. And she said, I'm happy for you. Our suffering brings us to awareness. And then she told a story about her father. And she said her father had bad teeth and eventually he just worked them all out. And he could only eat very soft food. And I thought, oh, that's a little bit too much information, but it piled discomfort onto discomfort. But it put me into this memorable place where I'd been taught the lesson that our pain gives us instruction. Our pain opens us to asking about our narrative, and our pain invites us through shared narrative to see that anything that we may think is only happening to us has happened so many millions of times over the course of history to so many millions of people. Okay, meditation. There's a place called meditation beyond the senses, beyond the mind, beyond the body, beyond you and me. Grani Anjali, who is no more, wrote those beautiful lyrics as a way for her students by crying out those words to remember that meditation allows us in intimacy to sift and sort through our viveka, through our discernment, through all of the mud and the garbage, and to be able to rise above whatever that wretched circumstance may have presented and ascend to that feeling place beyond the senses, beyond the mind, beyond the body, beyond you and me. Meditation purifies. Meditation requires that we work with the stuff of stuffness, that we work with history, that we work with personal history, and we work with social history. For those who have been reviled for whatever reason, for physical disability, for gender, for whatever proclivity that has formed the shores of that person's pond, by telling that narrative, by seeing the larger context, that story can be traced back to its origins, prati prasava. We spin out and we thread and we sew the narrative for each of our different worlds. Sava comes from su, the same root from which we get sutra, and sava means to sow. And pratiprasava means that we unsow, that we unravel all of the different threads so that nothing remains. And this becomes possible through meditation. To take a theme of one's life, a stitch, and reflect upon it. 
we have hanging in a hallway some forbidden stitching that was done in China in the 19th century. One of my cousins was a missionary curing cataracts through surgery. And she brought back our family members, each has a piece, a reminder of the women in China whose vision became compromised because the stitching was so minute. And that, when I see it, reminds me of the density with which we pack in all of our samskaras, all of our vasanas, all of our habits, and reminds me of this wonderful word in Sanskrit called nirgranta. The nirgrantis, the sadhus, the sages, those with wisdom, have unraveled all of those knots of personality through their meditation. And this has been one of the great joys of working with memory, working with dream, and working with an elevation toward the sattva, with an acknowledgement of the mud and muck out of which the lotus must arise. So this reciprocity, this reciprocity identified by Carl Jung is the shadow, the unconscious, the collective unconscious, and then the rising above into consciousness, simultaneously going deeper than the mud itself, into what he called the Amao Dei and what yoga calls Ishvara Vishesha Purusha. This notion that, wow, there's a great potential for elevation within the gift of human life. And in order to unravel the complexity of the human body, meditation, meditation, Meditation. And that meditation process for me has involved a monitoring of dreams, a remembrance of moments of inspiration, an abiding inquiry about what makes me do what I do. And also, and this is where, as a yoga teacher, your role becomes so fundamentally important because all of that emotionality becomes wrapped into the fascia. And that fascia constricted gradually through asana finds extension and the granularity of those karmas that have been cramped up in there a little bit, a little bit, a little bit can and will be released. For me, identified with a rather dramatic scoliosis as a teenager, finding that one move, in addition to all the general moves of yoga that began to allow that stretch and release, allowed the unraveling of a whole raft of emotions that have been tied into body image, into feelings of inadequacy, into feelings of weakness, all of which were undeniably real, and all of which were part narrative and part physical bodily reality. Every time you invite your students to stretch up, every time you invite your students to bend forward, you're bringing them into bodily experiences of elation and of humility. And these movements are meditations. 
These movements are occasions for bodily and emotional self-understanding. So when you weep, when your students weep, something shifts, something change, some change happens. And that change lies at the core of meditation. Yoga in all of its forms, meditation, meditation, meditation that purifies the kleshas and inclines one toward that special space of quiet, that feeling of repose in freedom. Indeed, in that state of reflection, for the one who has discriminative discernment and always takes no interest, there is the cloud of Dharma Samadhi. From that, there is cessation of afflicted action. Then, little is yet to be known due to the eternality of knowledge which is free from all impure covering. Prasam kyane pi akusidasya sarvata viveka kyater dharma mega samadhi prasam kyane pi akusidasya Sarvata viveka kyater dharma mega samadhi prasam kyane pi akusidasya sarvata viveka kyater dharma mega samadhi tataha klesha karma nivrittihi tataha klesha karma nivrittihi Tataha Klesha Karma Nivritihi Tada Sarva Avarana Mala Apetasya Jnyan Asya Anantyaj Jnaya Malpam Tada Sarva Avarana Mala Apetasya Jnyan Asya Anantyaj Jnaya Malpam Tada sarva arvarana mala apetasya jnanasya anantyaj jnayam alpam. So magnificent, the positivity conveyed by Patanjali in this string of sutras. So many metaphors to live by can be found here. First, with moving into a sustained reconnoitering of all of that stuff, all of those particles and pieces of what we call life, and by particularly applying discriminative discernment, this viveka kyati, repeatedly, consistently, effectively. And here he becomes a little bit of a punster. He says, in this moment, you no longer gather the interest. And the reason why we put this in quotes is that this is an allusion to monetary interest, that our work is put in the bank and it accrues interest, and then that interest comes and we cash in on that interest and then we deepen and extend karma. 
And interest is both metaphorical and literal here. As we've seen, vastu, the stuff of action, the stuff of the world, asserts itself, reasserts itself, reappears, demands that we deal with it as stuff. And along the way, in order for that to happen, we have to take interest. We have to take an intention to recommit to whatever stuff has presented itself. And in this state of ongoing discernment, rather than, oh yeah, I'm interested in that, rather than reaping the fruits of that action for good or ill, there's a buoyancy that comes about described as dharma megha, described as this fluffy cloud that floats above, protects within that bubble of samadhi an individual, protects that yogi from returning into that realm of cause and effect, that realm of karma fulla, that realm of samskara asserting and requiring a recommitment to a lower realm. What a beautiful image Patanjali presents, a layered image here of the cloud, a purified cloud, a place of abiding discernment from as if in that cloud, rather than karma casting its grip yet again. And when that happens, when that literal ascent into that meditative state, into that samadhi state, into that direct perception of the way things truly are, there is the cessation, the nivriti, the pulling back from klesha karma. Remarkable. An affirmation of yoga in a place of positivity, an affirmation of the true possibility of purity. And it says that as one dwells again and again in this place of discernment, in this place of an applied act of samadhi, those afflictions, the ignorance, the egotism, the attraction, the repulsion, the oomph, 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 got to keep going, that all of those are held in abeyance. And in that moment, you don't really have to know anything more. It's just a little, it's just life that's unfolding, but you're in wisdom. You have an eternal knowledge in the covering, the avarana, the cloak, the veil, if you will, has been removed. The time of our marriage, we had a beautiful day, a very deeply metaphorical day about Purusha and Prakriti becoming one. And in India, traditionally, a bride would remain veiled until several hours into the wedding. And for the first time in the social context of arranged marriage, the husband would really, literally see the wife. And as my bride, now wife of so many years, 
sat next to me veiled. That moment in the ceremony where the veil, which we still have, came off. Although we had known each other for many years, when that veil came off, it signaled a new life, a life of purity in commitment one to the other. To lift off the veil, again, the same image of Arana, taking away that covering. The inhale, the hold in the fullness of life, the exhale, the release, the hold of the exhale takes off the covering of that light, that light of illumination, that light of illumination made possible through the sustained practice of yoga. Now in the 19th century, the British around 1862 passed a law declaring Hindu theology to be grounded in a rejection of all things worldly. And the true religion was a religion valuing transcendence out of this world. And on the one hand, in these Sutras from Patanjali, yeah, there's certainly an ascent, a rising up into the fine mist, the pure white Dharma cloud. But at the same time, there's a sense that, yeah, action can be without affliction. Ah, klishta karma. Klesha karma nivritti. It's not that all action stops, but it's the klesha that stops. And like that, going back to the metaphor and the reality of marriage, the male and the female, or one soul and another soul, could be gender interchangeable, but one soul and another soul become the world for that other person. So one spouse commits to that spouse as the object of one subject and the reverse. So that in this beautiful commitment, in this vowed life together, walking side by side, Purusha engaging Prakriti, the seer and the seen, sometimes the seer, sometimes the seen, and the reverse, that this gives voice, this gives narrative to a life lived with purpose. This gives a little bit of hope, gives a little bit of inspiration that the crafting of karma can be done from a place of purity can be done within the context of dharma, of holding together the world, simultaneously with the ongoing application of jnana, the ongoing application of knowledge, the ongoing application of viveka kyati, discernment, discernment, discernment. 
So as yoga teachers, and as we've received from our yoga teacher on August 17th, 1974, there can be an invitation to celebrate this relationship between the field, the scene, and the knower of the field, the kshetra and the kshetra jnya. And for us, that role goes one to the other, like a little bit of a volley and serve, goes back and forth, and it's a dance. Sometimes she's up, sometimes I'm down, and the reverse. Sometimes we can help each other, sometimes not so much. But this was presented to us as an opportunity for creative expression, an opportunity to bring forth with one another a world to be created, literally eventually with the presence of children, a world to be engaged and cultivated, to be made as best possible perfect, samskirt, samskirtam, a perfected world to take the stuff of karma and refine it, to allow the spiral journey to ascend. And so also, as yoga teachers, you've been given a gift, not given to me, but as yoga teachers, you've been given a gift to perhaps even support yourself by being a beacon of light to your students. And your job is not to make them just, oh, wow, you're the yoga teacher. But your job is to create that safe space, that quiet space, through which, with the raw material of their particular individual objective reality and narrative, to be able to begin this upward journey whereby they can understand the karmas that are at the foundation, at the base of their particular mountain. And as each rung of the ladder brings that individual toward greater understanding of what has been and what remains, that truly becomes a gift to each and every pilgrim along this journey, along this pilgrimage, along this upward pilgrimage, built out of the raw material and the true stuff of life. Now in this, in this place of Dharma Mega Samadhi, in this place of enduring eternal Viveka Kyati, there can, rather remarkably, be no backsliding. There can, rather remarkably, be truly a rhythm that uncovers that veil cloaking the darkness. There can be pratyaksha, there can be a direct encounter of sat, of the authentic satya, of the truth, and of sattva, of that illumination that elevates. All actions can be performed in harmony with dharma, with virtue, and along the way, ego craving diminishes. So inspire your students to imagine themselves without selfishness, to imagine themselves without the burden of darkness that's knitted and stitched into the stuff of the human body, and give them encouragement 
that yes, piece by piece, thread by thread, that garment of the body, that garment of the life itself, that can be understood. That can be unraveled. That can be accepted for what was. And it can be reshaped. It can be refashioned. It can be redesigned so that the cloak, rather than being drab and heavy, that cloak can become cloud-like. That cloak can become virtuous. That place of habituation can simultaneously be a place of joy. And with that, with building a life toward freedom, with having understood what needed to be understood, one can move with wisdom. One can move with knowledge in freedom and ever toward freedom. From that, the purpose of the gunas is done and succession of parinama ceases. Succession and its correlate, the moment, terminate at the end of parinama. The return to the origin of the gunas, emptied of their purpose for the purusha, is freedom steadfastness in one's own form, and the power of higher consciousness. Tataha kirta artanam parinama karma samaptir gunanam. Tataha kirta artanam parinama karma samaptir gunanam. Tataha kirta artanam parinama karma samaptir gunanam. Kashana pratiyogi parinama aparanta nirgrahyaha kramaha. Kashana pratiyogi parinama aparanta nirgrahya kramaha. Kashana Pratiyogi Parinama Aparanta Nirgrahyaha Kramaha Purusharta Shunyanam Gunanam Pratiprasava Kaivalyam Swarupa Pratishta Va Chitti Shaktir Iti Purusharta shunyanam gunanam prati prasavaha kaivalyam svarupa pratishta va chiti shaktir iti. Purusharta shunyanam gunanam prati prasava kaivalyam svarupa pratishta va chiti Shaktir iti. Okay, once the Klishta karmas have been quelled, everything that needed to be done has been done. The purpose, the arta of the gunas themselves, the building blocks of all of the different worlds, all of the different realities. Everything that needed to be done has been done. And that succession, that flowing forth of the parinama, of the impulse of the kleshas, the klishta karmas, pushing through emotion and mind and thought and ego, through the senses, through the body, 
grabbing and holding on to the physicality of the world, all of that process of here and this and that, all of those different worlds held in abeyance, they cease. When that happens, the moment, the kashana, terminates. There's a moment of things being held. Dissolving, as it were, into that place of quiet. The gunas that have been rolled out, woven for the benefit of experience and freedom, have been called back, pretty prasava, to their place of origin. And in that, they've been, in a sense, just sort of emptied for the sake of Purusha, for the sake of that witness consciousness, for the sake of that spectator who merely looks on. Patanjali defines this as kaivalyam, as freedom, Singularity. And in this singular freedom, particular to each and every elevated yogi, there's a pratishta, there's a standing sta, pratishta, a standing in svarupa all the way back to the third sutra, at the very beginning of the Yoga Sutras, Svarupa Avastana. And those moments of Narodha, Drashtar, the seer, the Purusha, just stands. And in a beautiful, playful manner, the goddess actually gets the last word. Okay, the goddess has been viscerally present, subliminally present, through the use of feminine gender terms throughout the first pada in particular. There's a playfulness to Patanjali. And whenever in that first part he talks about all those several dozen ways of doing yoga, he uses the feminine. He uses the feminine gender to signal how yoga can be made part and parcel of one's life. And he ends the entire concatenation, the collection, the gathering together of all of this insight and all of the specific practices, he ends it with an invocation, chitti shakti, power of chitti, of that which possesses chit, power shakti, in contrast with citta, vritti, citta, the outflow of of consciousness, vritta in all of its fluctuations, all of its vulnerabilities, if you will. But here, no, we have citti, okay? Chit, just pure consciousness, attached not to a dissipation through fluctuation, but attached to shakti, attached to the goddess, the goddess writ large. So we've learned from Patanjali 
that everything that happens in the realm of chitta of those fluctuations derivative seemingly of consciousness, but we've learned that no, there are fluctuations that are designed for consciousness, and that that, at one level, becomes mirrored. And again, the image of the mirror, we want the sattva to reflect the clarity of the seer, and we want the clarity of the seer to reflect through sattva and literally shed light on the purpose, shed light on why do we have this whole drama and dance of life. And it's for the seer to know the seer. So this notion of chitti shakti suggests that consciousness can, after this long process of clarification, of purification, that this consciousness remains known through the power of the awareness manifested with the goddess. And in this, we find a process almost really literally of dynamization. That the whole world becomes divine. The whole world is not other than consciousness working out itself. Now some theologians and philosophers Shankara, Ramanuja, from the Advaitin tradition, would say that everything just is inseparable from that consciousness. In the case of Shankara, in the case of Ramanuja, that everything in the particularity contains a shard of that consciousness, a piece of that consciousness. And what Patanjali does rather elliptically, rather inscrutably, but nonetheless with a clear signal, particularly in his languaging of what is the arta? What is the arta of experience? And the arta, the purpose of the manifest world, the world of objects, the world of narrative, The purpose of this entire dance is ultimately for freedom, for liberation, apavarga, moksha, in this text, kaivalyam, to rise to that singularity where simultaneously there's a reflection through sattva, shakti, okay? in service of consciousness, power flowing forth, no longer mediated, no longer vitiated by the presence of klishta karmas. There's been an erasure, a setting aside of ignorance. There's been a setting aside of ego. There's been a setting aside of allure, of attachment. There's been a setting aside of disdain, of hatred. There's been a setting aside even of, like, oh, I got to keep this going. Okay, with that clarity, dawns a moment variously described as prajna, wisdom, vivekakyati, discernment. A moment of kaivalyam, singularity. A moment of samapati, collapse of difference between subject and object in process. A moment of dharma mega samadhi. A moment where sort of a buoyant expectancy in this cloud of virtue. A moment 
of Nerodha, of cessation, a moment at the time of death of Sarva Nerodha, where everything goes into a place of quiescence. Yoga, a disentangling, a sifting through, and literally finding the needle, the gleaming diamond within that haystack. And with that moment, that instant, everything that needed to be done has been done. All of the nooks and crannies have been explored and figured out. Everything has been resolved back to that niggling point of origin. And with that, Svarupa Pratishta, a standing Samastiti, a standing, the giant posture, Kayot Sarga. No karmas remain that bring one into that place of tamas or negativity. No karmas accrue that would call one downward into that place of tamas. Shunya, only empty, only empty, only empty. In the Jain literature, the correlate word for kaivalyam is kevala. And they actually have paintings and statues of people in this blessed state, in this elevated state, occupying the Siddha Loka, the realm, the world of the siddhas, those who are perfected. And some of them stand simply in the stillness of the uprisen body, Kayot Sarga, and others sit tranquilly in Padma Asana, as if resting upon a lotus. And each bears the countenance of calm, of equanimity, of ongoing, thoroughgoing practice, of maitri, friendliness, compassion, karuna, sympathetic joy, mudita, and equanimity, upeksha. And as you discuss freedom with your students, use all the amazing resources available. Bring in the poetry of Mary Oliver, which so eloquently conveys that moment of reflective repose. Bring in the playful poetry of Rumi that invites moving into that meadow beyond all of the distinctions and judgments. Invite in that occasional insight from Shakespeare The whole world is a stage, and we are merely players upon it. Invite in those narrative analogies from your own experience. Humanize yourselves to your students. Humor them with a little bit of your own folly. And invite your students to reflect upon even the possibility of not messing it up, to reflect upon the spoken possibility given in this last Yoga Sutra that you really can 
figure it all out and remain undisturbed. And we know from earlier sutras that these moments themselves, these moments of of joy, can be fleeting. Yet to simply share with a student that moments of perfection can and will dawn, can and will bestow a feeling of grace and blessing, that that encouragement can help overcome a little bit of the pervasive anxiety, the pervasive difficulty, the pervasive cloudiness. Some days are a little bit more cloudy than others. Some months are a little bit more cloudy or even years or decades. But recall, those people who through their positivity send an assurance, it will be okay. It will be in that place once more where all is well, all is well. In this segment, we will discuss, explore, investigate the various ways in which Patanjali presents the practice of meditation. In Sanskrit, the word is dhyana, and in thinking about this word, we see that for Patanjali, it becomes inseparable from that which precedes it in the Ashtanga Yoga list, dharana, often translated as concentration, literally meaning holding. And the word that follows it in the Eightfold List, samadhi. And samadhi means the vision, the dhi, that is up close, ah, and connected, some. So dharana, holding, leading into dhyana, meditation, delivering a person to samadhi. Interestingly, we see the word appear in the second pada, the third pada, and the fourth pada. But in the first pada, What's outlined, moving toward the eventual articulation of dhyana, but the first mention that we find in the first pada of the word is apimata dhyana, va, to choose and pick up any meditation that you desire. So again, meditation, pot of one, whatever you want to do. Meditation, pot of two, it will help overcome klishta karmas. Meditation, pot of three, combined with dharana and samadhi, it provides a power of constructing a world with meaning. And again, in pot of four, we see that dhyana, becomes the vehicle through which one overcomes afflicted action. So as we go back to the very beginning, atta yoga nushasanam, this whole enterprise of learning about yoga that we're undertaking begins the second sutra 
yogas chitta vritti narodaha narodaha bringing the fluctuations of the mind of consciousness to a place of stillness and as we enter into the various paths that are given for entering naroda we see that the first is abhyasa meaning you got to do this you've got to practice and vairagya which means that you need to develop a sense of remove a sense of rising above a sense that whatever it is that you commit to you're doing it for and toward an elevation of sense of being and one of the quasi meditational lists given in the very beginning involves five practices well known from buddhism shraddha which is holding the ha shrad a version of the heart of having sort of a convincement not just a blind faith but a convincement that yes this will prove effective effective at what overcoming the difficulties or my difficult relationship with the difficulties that are woven inextricably throughout experiences of life another meditative state a state that perhaps allows one to stand firmly within meditation is virya the marshaling of strength within oneself within one's being within the world as well as mindfulness smriti remembrance as my own yoga teacher saying when i forget forget to remember i dismember of remember that we need with our meditation and with our meditative life as it's being built to recall to recollect to recollect to remember to put it back together in service of this higher calling and this higher calling articulated in samadhi that wonderful state of absorption where it all fits together it all becomes part of a purified relationship and then finally in this buddhist list prajna a word that appears as an outflow of meditation various places in the text in prajna is wisdom is that knowledge very spiritual intuitive discerning knowledge that is then pra brought forth is offered so shraddha virya smriti samadhi prajna beautiful words offered by patanjali also in the first pada we're given instruction in regard to ishvara ishvara the lord ishvara defined here as a very special specific purusha who has never fallen into the trap of the seeds of karma the growth of karma or the fruition of karma untouched forever so it sets up an object of meditation beyond the realm of conceptualization furthermore linked to this ishvara we see a connection made 
with vibration, with what Patanjali names as pranava, the speaking forth the new, the calling out pra, the calling out into that vast expanse of vibration. And we know from secondary literature, we know from other places going all the way back earlier even than the Upanishads, that the word invoked, Om, encloses and discloses the vibrations at the root of the universe, at the root of human experience. It further advises, perform japa, Oh, oh, oh. Carry that intimacy with vibration through cultivated repetition, and this becomes a form of meditation. Now, later in the first pada, we get a definition of what happens when one meditates. And it's called samapati, defined as the collapse of distinction between object, subject, and the intermediary between the two. The grahya, that which is grasped, the grahana, the process of grasping, and the grahitur, the grasper. So in states of meditation that arise within samapati to what may be described as samadhi, there will be a collapse of difference. Emotionally, what can arise from that is empathy. And the ethical delivery on empathy would be compassion. Grounded, however, for its authenticity in the outflow from a meditative experience. Then specifics are given. Objects, physical objects, are invoked, are called in to be objects upon which to meditate. It could be an image, a photograph. It could be a beautiful tree. It could be a sad tree. It could be a flower. But an object, an object such as a flame or the wafting of incense, that object becomes a way of first holding returning the mind through smriti, through remembrance, I'm here devoting my attention to this flame. And then whenever the mind goes off to bring it back, whenever the mind goes off to bring it back, so that eventually the flow of attention goes from requiring the presence of that object to being able to simply be with that object, even with eyes closed. And that flow, that alignment of riti, riti, fluctuation, fluctuation, one after the other in that process of holding, rises to the state of the meditative state. So that even without the object there, it's as if you've joined with it. And then, sa vichara rather than requiring a physical prop with sa vichara there will be a cogitation a reflection again a reconnoitering of some aspect of comportment some aspect of those subtle residues of karma that propel 
the individual one way or the other. And by focusing, by holding, by asking, where, impulse, did you first arise? Feeling it in the body, those subtle textures, reviewing it in the place of memory, those impulses, sometimes quite unhealthy. And then there becomes an awareness in this third category of sabija, of the seeds from which those particular behaviors arise. And the sabija level allows through story and narrative a revelation to arise. Oh yeah, that's what it's all about. And once the story is named, once the picture is drawn, then it can lose its sting. And that seed can wither and disappear. And that state near bija, that state of seedless samadhi, that state of freedom and liberation relies upon steady commitment to perform dhyana, to perform meditation. And it says in the second pada, dhyana heyas tad vritayaha. It says that all of these klishtakarma vrittis, all of these difficulties in life that simmer and bubble up from the subtle body, yearning, demanding enactment in the physical realm, that all of those negativities can and will and must be avoided, chaos, from, through, the application of meditation, of dhyana. Now this, interestingly, brings us to the question of practice. And I want to talk a little bit personally here. In my first encounters, when I was 13, with meditation, came through the book in person of Philip Kaplow, a very early sort of first wave 1960s meditation teacher who had trained in Zen for some 12 years in Japan before settling in Rochester, New York. And his gentle way of inviting people into Zazen, which is in fact the Japanese pronunciation with an extra syllable, Zen is from the Sanskrit dhyan. And what he invited, and what he wrote about in the book, sharing his training in Japan, and I started this at 13, was breathe in one, exhale two. Breathe in three, exhale four. Breathe in five, exhale six. Breathe in seven, exhale eight. Breathe in nine, exhale 10. Breathe in one, exhale two. Simple, direct, repetitive, meditative. And with that arises sort of a little bit of a flow necessitated and aided by and through. The drifting mind has to remember, oh, what number am I on? And then going back, and if you've lost track, to start all over again. And this becomes, in a sense, a, a type of 
replacement so that rather than the thoughts being scattered, 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 the thoughts are moving with the rhythm and the count of the breath. And this opens the individual through this form of concentration, which at moments can lead into dhyana and samadhi, into beginning to, with the opening of the eyes, the re-engagement of the gaze, to be able to make as part of this process of meditation, the ongoing application of viveka kyati, sort of open-eyed, out and about in the world, meditative awareness that, oh, I know how karma works, I don't think I want to go over here. And oh, wow, these people, I like these people in the yoga class, this is really gonna work in terms of providing that place of stability. And slowly but surely, all of these meditative practices produce the desired effect. And the desired effect of meditation lies in the ability of meditation to quiet the kleshas, to quiet the impurities, to empty them, to give them away, to allow those impurities to dissipate, and in that emptying, in that purity, prakasha, light, radiance, sattva, liberation can happen. Ethics. When I was a young person, I didn't want to hear that word. It sounded austere. It sounded chastising. It sounded a little bit too patriarchal, perhaps. And actually, for good reason. Because in the history, particularly of Western civilization, really, perhaps even from the time of the Ten Commandments, ethics linked itself, was in fact expressed through lists of thou shalt, thou shalt, thou shalt, and it was usually thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. And no teenager wants to be told what to do. However, with yoga, we're given a project of self-examination grounded in theories of karma, whereby consequences to be observed and tested result in a sense of a need for responsibility. And now as I'm older, I understand that, yeah, a lot of children need to be told, don't do that, don't do that. And that that chiding and that coaching can lead to an effectively ethical life. In yoga, the context becomes the gateway into the practice of ethics. And in the very first chapter of the Yoga Sutra in Pada One, Patanjali offers a time-tested and true path 
into ethical behavior that had been long itemized by the Buddhists, acknowledged by the Jains, resurfacing in all manner of literature throughout centuries and centuries. And this list called the Brahma Vihara specifies four abodes, four go-to places, four viharas, in order for someone to emulate what it means to have the best comportment, the comportment, the carriage modeled by Brahma, the everything of the universe at its best, and by the Brahman, the mediate, the person who mediates, either as priest or teacher, as physician or lawyer, the person who mediates wisdom for others. And in yoga, we see that if you're in the company of fine, wonderful, grounded people, be friendly. Maitri, in Pali, metta. But the idea is to cultivate feelings of goodwill around those people of goodwill. Sukha, happy. Metta, be happy. Be friendly with such company. Then the second context identified, dukkha, people who suffer, people who are mired in difficulty, disease, people who really struggle to put one foot in front of the other. And for those people, the proper behavior to be exhibited is karuna, is compassion. Third, some people really, really, really amazing with their accomplishment, their physicality, their beauty, their intelligence, their all-around goodness. For those people, rather than getting envious or jealous, the ethic within yoga says, develop sympathetic joy. And I love this because this list is about cultivating inner responsivity as appropriate. And I love sympathetic joy is an ethical call. And then finally, for those without any redeeming qualities whatsoever, what Patanjali recommends is equanimity, upeksha, upeka in Pali, to be able to have acknowledgement without affirming any bad behavior and have acknowledgement without condemning that bad behavior or at least not condemning the person who has fallen under the sway of negativity. One's reminded of the phrase, hate the sin, don't hate the sinner. A little bit stronger than yoga language, but I think that's a sufficient way in which we can regard equanimity. These four, friendliness, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity become in and of themselves powers to be manifested with the samyama of the third pada, with coming out of those very rarefied states of quiet back into the realm of activity to use those frameworks to cultivate those skills in order to engage, in order also to discern. Now, 
Patanjali also includes thou shall not. And his list is five though thou shall not. Thou shall not commit violence. Ahimsa. Thou shall not tell a lie. Satya. Thou shall not steal. Asteya. Thou shall not engage in unclean or inappropriate sexual behavior. Brahmacharya, a little bit like Brahma Vihara. Right? Do it the better way. And then finally, thou shall not hoard a parigraha. Now this collection of moral instruction, namely abstain from violence, abstain from lying, abstain from theft, abstain from hurtful sexual encounter, abstain from having too much stuff. Upon closer reflection and upon the way that I was trained within these modalities is not about just following rules, but in fact, the ethics of yoga requires reflection, consideration, and a broadening of definition. So with nonviolence, it doesn't merely mean, although it certainly includes, stop using foul language, it hurts people's ears. It doesn't merely mean don't hit somebody, but it also means let's look at structural violence. Let's look at dietary violence. Let's look at emotional violence. And by exploring all of those different avenues, an ethical worldview can be cultivated and embodied. Martin Luther King Jr. invited his good friend who had studied in India in the 1950s, studied with Gandhians committed to the practice of nonviolence, he invited his friend, Reverend James Lawson, to open a school in Tennessee in a church basement. And he taught people how and why, as Jesus advised, to turn the other cheek. And with this nonviolent community commitment, society changed for the better. Nonviolence. Truth. Not merely don't tell lies, but to go to the essence, the quintessence, the pure presence, the pure being of a thing. And not merely give it a name, but make the space to be with that tree, a tree is an expression of truth. With that rock, a rock is an expression of truth. To be with that moment of sincere, authentic encounter with a friend or relative, that level of truth, much broader, more profound than merely don't tell a lie and not stealing. Applying social analysis to theft, applying psychic analysis to interpersonal relationship and conversation 
Okay, all of that, as we would journal every week, we would come up with very simple observations about, oh, I talked a little bit too long and I stole a little bit of time from someone. And then the consequences of sexual misbehavior, it's always an ebb and flow, but venereal disease comes and goes, but it's always sort of a looming threat for the licentious. And then there's a simple issue of respect and dignity, allowing people without manipulation to set their own rules, to set their own boundaries in terms of even simple flirtation profound lessons to be learned. Lessons that really can't be told by others, although others hopefully will send signals that could help move the culture and of course the individual toward appropriate behavior. And then finally, the hoarding, hoarding, hoarding. This is the great American disease. We have so much stuff. The ocean is moaning and groaning with the weight of human created plastic that has come to occupy almost every nook and cranny of the ocean. Our landfills claiming and taking away entire canyons in the mountains. Not only do we have things, but with things comes trash. And to consider minimizing possession, this is a good thing, a very, very, very good thing. And then in terms of comportment, in terms of ethical behavior, we have five rules to live by on the positive. The first, Seemingly simple is to keep things clean, to keep things tidy. American consumer culture has been very, very quick to respond to a basic human need for cleanliness. A whole array of different toothpastes and soaps and hair conditioners and, you know, entire fortunes Entire business empires have been built on the business of keeping clean. And that's a good thing. And a thing that, however, can signal the need to go beyond mere physical cleanliness to dispositional cleanliness. And sometimes within oneself, and one can journal, if you're given this practice to cultivate and to develop and to build upon, there may be a little bit of a, of a negative. There may be a little bit of a shadow thought that would benefit from a good scrub, a good like, why did I even want to think that? Or why did, allow, why did I allow myself to fall into that funky mood? that our moods also periodically need to be cleansed. Contentment, to draw out within, from within oneself, a basic attitude, it's really gonna be okay. And this attitude itself is spoken by Julian of Norwich while in the midst of the plague, so many people were dying. She just, not arrogantly, and certainly without cruelty, but she said, all will be well. And she survived the plague. She was in sort of a quarantine, but her words gave solace to many, many who had to accept the death of so many people, so many loved ones. 
but to be able to have a baseline go-to place of contentment helps build a way to be in the world that is ethically informed and inspiring for others. And then bringing it a little bit to a level of greater rigor, we find the Patanjali advises tapas, advises testing our metal, M-E-T-T-L-E, testing our own strength to endure situations of difficulty. Not eating for a period, perhaps renouncing certain foods for a period, a little bit like the Christian practice of Lent, perhaps refraining from speech, perhaps being silent. Okay, this, an inward practice, then can be a benefit in terms of the choice of words following. And all of this in service always of svadhyaya, of reflecting on both aspects of oneself, one's involvement within the world and reflecting on that place of quiet, that place of the ultimate ideal. In this 10th ethical practice, the practice of Ishvara Pranidhana, rather than moving outward, we're advised to move inward and move upward and feature our own personhood and fashion our lifestyle to be in imitation of those ascended saints and sages who have modeled a behavior intimate with that place of quiet, purified of the various afflictions at the root of human psychology and committed to being present, being of service, being within the world, but not necessarily of worldliness, not necessarily of a place identifying with lower impulse, but working through the cultivation of ethics to lift up oneself and in the process, lift up others as well. Congratulations. Either you've fast forwarded and you've landed on the last episode. I know when I read, sometimes I'll read the last chapter first. It's not really a terribly auspicious habit, but if you take this as your preview, um, you may or may not be disappointed. But congratulations if in fact you've landed in the last third of these 20 hours. 20 hours is quite a journey, quite a commitment, quite a pilgrimage. And what we'll do in these last 20 minutes is speak to the human condition, assuming that as a person engaged with yoga, or as a person teaching yoga, that you are digging into the fertile soil of self, of lower self, of body, of impulse, informed by this yogic gift that through yoga we can come 
to a place of quiet. And here, I also want to point out what may be obvious to many, that there is, in fact, a linkage between the mindful tradition that has become popular in schools and in workplaces and even in government, that this whole practice of breath regulation, breath attention, body attention, the exercises given in the various trainings of chewing on a raisin and experiencing the flavor, that all of these things intersect with yoga significantly. Yoga, Buddhism, Jainism share a common ground, share a common concern. And that common ground, that common concern, is conviction, convincement of the possibility of freedom. Now that freedom can be experienced on so many different levels. On the feeling tone level, on the physical level, on the spiritual level. And what yoga has scripted within the Yoga Sutra of Patanjali, which contains kernels, sort of moments, just brief sentences that are more suggestive than elaborate, what yoga suggests is that we inhabit this body. That this body links to breath, and that our breath similarly cannot be separated from our mind and our mind cannot be separated from our breath. It gives a physiology of the body that talks about the belly, talks about the throat, talks about the head, as well as the heart. And rather than being mechanical, there's gastric juices, or you have a larynx, or you have a brain. This physiology of yoga suggests that so much depends upon the operation and the center of your body of digestion. That so much depends upon the clearness of voice, giving voice to emotion. That so much depends upon our ability to allow even the possibility of recognizing that there are wonderful exemplars of perfection and that all of this settles into our heart and through intuitions of the heart, we can know everything that we need to know. Amazing affirmation of human physicality. And then the breath, okay, the inhale, and the hold, the exhale, and the hold. And more than once, this notion introduced by Patanjali speaks to the potential of lifting off the layers, lifting off the covers, lifting off the cloaking, lifting off the veil that reveals such splendor, such spaciousness, 
such glory, such luminosity. Okay, this is an anthropology of a human person with really boundless potential. That's at the ground of why the Buddhists meditate, why the Hatha yogis perform asana and pranayama, why the Jains become so fastidious in their observance of nonviolence, that by meditating, we can find that inner peace. By stretching and moving the fascia and filling the body with pran, we can release all manner of impurities. And for the Jains, every time we work to protect the life of another being, even as small as a microorganism, we are able to release lifetimes of karmas that are fraught with difficulty, fraught with affliction. Now, that brings us out of the sublime into sometimes the ridiculous, but often the inevitable that according to yoga, in order to truly get in touch with this moment of release, this moment of felt freedom, the shadow must be encountered. And that shadow manifests in illness, in disordered breath, in doubt, in various forms of disease, in completely being hither and yon, okay, a whole list of what's called dharmanasya, negative mental spaces, negative thoughts that manifest through negative bodily experiences. Okay, that's to be encountered. And then the other piece, the klishta karma part, must also be acknowledged. To understand ignorance signals the beginning of knowledge. Anitya suchi dukkhanatma su, nitya suchi sukatma kyatir avidya. The move toward knowledge discerns everything changes. Nothing stays the same. Second, take a second look. Namely, may have a beautiful cover, but you look inside and it may not what it at first appears to be. That we may think that something is just pure and wonderful and great, but then we discern that, oh, no, it wasn't quite that. And similarly, not unrelated, we may think, oh, this is this experience. This is really the vacation that I need. And we can build it up in our minds and we can think, oh, it's going to be so great. It's going to be so great. And then we get there and no, it's sort of everything that was bothering me over there is bothering me here as well. Okay, the inevitability of that disappointment. And then finally, the beginning of knowledge is possible through making a list of everything that you think you are and then saying, well, is that really who I am? And then we realize that we can take none of it to the grave and that everything that we have owned, every accomplishment that we have put up on the trophy case, 
All of those things will eventually dissipate, but one thing remains. And that one thing is that place of quiet. What else takes us out of that quiet? Well, one of them is egoism. Making it all about self with a little less. Not a healthful way to engage the world. Nor is attraction, gotta have it, gotta have it, can lead to addiction. Nor is the negativity, oh, I hate that. Okay, that doesn't help. Okay, all of these kleshas, including the fifth klesha, got to keep going, all of these kleshas can be penetrated, can be brought into the light, can be understood through processes of meditation. Meditation, both the silent sort, stilling, calming, And another sort lifted up again and again by Patanjali called Viveka Kyati. Viveka, discernment, sorting it out. And in the midst of activity, being quick to analyze, being quick to say, hey, let's think twice about jumping into this one. And here, I think the the business model of the mission statement can be very instructive. If one's mission statement is Ishvara Pranidhana, namely dedication to a highest ideal, then show up with that mission statement If you're asked to undertake a task, put it through that test of discernment. Will this advance my ethical commitment? Will it reside in a way within my life that supports nonviolence and authenticity, not stealing, appropriate behavior? Will it advance my desire not to be defined by things. And if you're a person of yoga, that test can become the gold standard for your own commitment. Regular practice requires awakeness in every single circumstance. Ask the questions. Does this bring contentment to myself and to others? Discern, discern, discern. Now, the last part that I want to share in terms of freedom pertains to the freedom granted by service, the freedom granted by humility. Humility, getting down to the hummus, the humus, the stuff of soil, the stuff of the earth. And in this simple pranam, in this simple namaste, in this simple bow, there's a giving up of oneself and an exposure of one's vulnerability. I'm thinking a little bit of dogs that want to play and they just put their front paws out and they give this body language, let's frolic. Well, the body language of humility is recognition of the earth, 
recognition that however mighty we may think we have become, we must always remember the earth whose food gives us life. We must always remember the body that was given by our parents and recognize and as appropriate, appreciate the sacrifices made. Decisions that might have been difficult, but nonetheless, without others, we could not be. So this gesture of namaste, rather universal, the bow throughout Asia, puts one in a healthy place of humility, a reminder that without the other, this could not be. In our yoga classes, in those years of training, and in the yoga classes that I myself teach, part of the gesture at the very beginning is to form a circle and with open hands, hands of peace, to invite everyone all at once to come down to the earth and then in arising to bring one hand to the other in this blessed Anjali Mudra and this blessed gesture of Namaste. And in speaking that word, Namaste, The human voice acknowledges, this is me, and this is you, and truly, let us always remember, we share a common ground, and that common ground to which we can return again and again is that beautiful meadow, that beautiful silent cave, that beautiful place beyond distinction, that beautiful, calm, quiet place, that place of yoga. Thank you for staying the course with the Yoga Sutra. The Yoga Sutra deliciously invites learning about yoga in a way accessible to so many people without requiring adherence to any one particular belief system and allows you as a person of yoga to engage on a journey of self-exploration. And as through this course, you have received many, many, many different tools, the invitation would be to use, now that you own this, to use this perhaps inviting your students in once in a while, but to use it perhaps as also a way of structuring a year of yoga for your students. One way might be to give an overview of some of the philosophical terms from the Yoga Sutra, including Chittavriti Naroda, including Yama Niyama, including seer and seen, big picture, and then assigning, experimenting, playing with some of the many practices. 
You've heard about nonviolence. To ask the students themselves to experiment with different ways in which they would invite nonviolence into their own way of life. To think about the breath. To think about the disordered breath where the svasa, prasvasa may be a little bit out of balance. And to think about the regulation of breath talked about in pranayama. Invite your students to breathe in, to hold, to breathe out, and to hold and to count. And you might want to revisit the psychology of yoga, a psychology grounded in a definition of the human person as twofold, a piece of the person always aware and awake, and another piece of the person mired to varying degrees in the klishta karmas. And by reflecting on these karmas, in light of gunas, in light of states of density, heaviness, in light of activity, and vibration, and in light of the sublime, students can design, self-design, a project of self-reflection that would allow this discovery to be an opportunity for creativity and for joy. You're also invited, of course, to repeat the Sanskrit, to perhaps consult a book that includes the Sanskrit, break down the words, learn, increase your own vocabulary a little bit, read it again and again and again and again. The Yoga Sutra has been an important part of my life since 1972. Every time one engages the Yoga Sutra, it's possible to see something different. It's possible to find it speaking to something, speaking to something that you're able to understand at a different level. So again, congratulations. You've completed your encounter with Patanjali. Now, take this yoga, take this knowledge, and bring it, bring it out a little bit into your life and into the world. Namaste. Thank you for listening to this series of lectures about the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali from Professor Christopher Chapel. The GLOW podcast has also published another series of lectures from Professor Chapel about the history of yoga. You can find the links to listen to them on glo.com, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Derek Mills.